And so we have uh, recently studied and, of course, just memorialized the death of Jesus uh, through partaking of the Lord's Supper. And this morning's sermon kind of takes its jumping off point uh, from this in Luke chapter 23. And so uh, we find ourselves uh, at the, on the hill of Calvary where Jesus, Luke chapter 23, verse 32, it says, There were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiments and cast lots. This morning I want us to analyze the biblical concept of forgiveness, jumping off from here where Jesus, uh, at his almost to the point of death, looks out at those who had committed a great sin against him, lies, mocking, beatings, mock trials, and actually murder, and continues, even through that suffering and persecution, being an innocent man, continues to do his Father's will. Remember, he said he came, Luke 19, verse 10, to seek and to save the lost. When he looked out over the individuals there, there were some followers of his, but the majority of those people were lost. And he said, Father, forgive them, because that's what he came to do, right? He came here to bring about hope, to bring about the opportunity to have one's sins forgiven. No matter how bad the sin was, he being murdered, an innocent man, not seeking vengeance or revenge, always hoping for the best, wanting what was best for those people. To the point where he understood that I have to die in order for them to have that hope, in order for them to have the forgiveness of sins, I have to die. And of course he did. He died there on that cross. And where many individuals would have sought to try to save self, and we might say that's a natural instinct that we're born with, right? That we, that we always try, we don't uh, intentionally, uh, by nature, try to do something harmful to ourselves. We always try to do something that makes us feel good. <laughs> so in a situation where we might have found individuals wanting to save self, Jesus saw the sins of the world and recognized it was he who had to be the sinless lamb of God in, other, in, in order to, that those he saw might have opportunity to be saved. So he gave himself to save others. And of course, the Bible says there's no greater friend than one who will give his life for his friends. Jesus not only gave his life for his friends, he gave his life for people who hated him. So there's no greater friend than Jesus in that example. And through this example here, we see the attitude that Jesus had that he was going to finish the reason he came for. And that could be a, a sermon in and of itself. Many times we start things and don't finish. Jesus started something and he got to the end and said, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to complete my mission. And fortunate for us, he did because it opened up that fountain of salvation, that fountain of freedom from past sins. In this statement, Father, forgive them, he, he, uh, he points out a lesson that we see throughout the entirety of the Bible, but in particular in the New Testament as it applies to the blood of Jesus, that sin requires forgiveness in order for there to be a uh, a relationship between God and man. God was not going to allow this great sin to go without consequence, right? All sin has consequence. And so these individuals 
Jesus says they know not what they do. That was not to give them an excuse because they should have known what they were doing. Jesus had lived among them for three years and shown by evidences above and beyond rational decision making or doubt that he was the son of God. He, can, he performed miracles. He raised people from the dead. He did things no man could do except he be from God. Nicodemus recognized that. John chapter 3. So these people had no excuse because the fact that they didn't know what they were doing was not an excuse. They still needed to be forgiven of their sins. It shows the horrific way in which God sees sin. Sin is what nailed Jesus to the cross. So those who uh, needed forgiveness of sin were separated from God, right? You don't need forgiveness of sin if you're right with God. <laughs> if you're right with God, you've not separated yourself from God. Sin is a transgression of the law. 1 John 3 verse 4, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. It separates us from God. It's our actions that separate us from God. These people were separated from God. So in this statement, Father, forgive them. Jesus is pointing out, number one, they're separated from God. And number two, they have to be forgiven in order to be, be brought back into a right relationship with God. Now, the church is established in Acts chapter 2. So there's still a process taking place in the context that we're reading about immediately before the gospel is first preached there in Acts chapter 2. But remember that those great words at the end of Peter and those other apostles' sermon was repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Remission there being forgiveness, having your past sins remitted. Okay? So when that first gospel sermon is preached in Act, as, we, as recorded in Acts chapter 2, we also note that what Jesus was saying here wasn't that people were going to be forgiven of their sins without condition. They were offered forgiveness of sins, Acts 2 verse 38, for the first time in the church age by means of repentance. So God said, let's just say you didn't know what you were doing. All right, Because Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. As I pointed out, they should have known. They had all the evidence they needed to know. God didn't say, well, you all did it ignorantly. Your sins are forgiven, did he? No, that's not how forgiveness of sins takes place. He said, repent. They had to acknowledge that what they had done was sin. It separated them from God. They needed forgiveness. And then do something about it. Prior to that, they had heard the gospel. right? Acts chapter 2. Peter and the other apostles preached to them. At the end there in verse 36, he said, let, let this be known assuredly that you all have with wicked hands slain the Son of God. Now, even if they were ignorant at the time that they murdered him, they're not ignorant anymore. An explicit statement of guilt has been put upon them. This Jesus that we preach, Peter said, is the man you put to death. You murdered him. Now at that point in time, they had, no, they had no further excuse, right? They didn't have an excuse the first time because they should have known. But now they've had, their sin has been addressed explicitly. You have slain the Son of God. Well, in Acts chapter 2, the Bible tells us there was a response. The first response that we read about there is, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Which is the reasonable response, right? Now they know what they've done. And God didn't say, well, you did it ignorantly. You didn't know what you were doing. Jesus said to forgive you, so I forgave you without you doing anything about it. No, that's not what he said. He said, repent. Repent means to acknowledge what you've done is error and then not do it again and change and do something opposite. The opposite was Stop doing what you were doing and now start following the Word of God. But that wasn't the end, was it? Repent and be baptized, Acts chapter 2, 38, for the remission of sins. So before a person could be forgiven, 
Even though Jesus' uh, desire was that they be forgiven, before they could be forgiven, they had to repent and be baptized. Of course, now we see that in Acts chapter 2, we see a new dispensation, the church age. There was a new law system. The testator had died. He had nailed the old law to the cross, Colossians 2 verse 14. Now he had died and enacted his new covenant, his new testament. And under that new covenant, that new testament, the conditions of salvation or forgiveness of sin included repentance and baptism. And of course, in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, we see that that plan to save or forgive is also the means by which an individual gains entrance into the kingdom of God. The Lord added to the church, which is the same as the kingdom. Every time you read of the church and the kingdom after Acts chapter 2, they're talked about in the same way. It's the same entity. It's a blood-bought institution. It holds the saved, the people who have been forgiven of their past sins. So there were conditions to that forgiveness. It should be our desire that all people be forgiven of their sins too, just like it was Jesus, but those individuals have a responsibility to be forgiven of their sins just like we did. We must acknowledge, we must hear the word of God as those in Acts chapter 2 did. We must believe it it must prick our hearts, and then we must believe it to the point of saying, what do we need to do about it? And whatever the Lord says to do, we do. So when Peter told those individuals, repent, they did. At least 3,000 souls. And when he told them to be baptized, they were, because they understood that's how they received forgiveness of sins. Being forgiven of their past sins, being saved from their past sins, and being in the church, Acts chapter 2, all takes place with one plan to save, right? They heard the word of God. It produced faith. Their faith was a living faith. They acted upon that faith through repentance. They confessed that Jesus was the Christ and they were baptized. The Lord washed away their sins that day. It took the blood of Jesus, but it also took the act of those individuals who had been pricked in the heart to do whatever was necessary to have that sin forgiven. They were added to the kingdom, and then, of course, that life began, right? A new life, a new creature, a Christian began. And so we see here in this statement in Luke chapter 23, not just Jesus' desire and willingness to forgive those who hated him and his friends, but an acknowledgement that they were lost and needed forgiveness and that he wanted to and did fulfill his mission to make it possible. Jesus was not just, he didn't just want them to be forgiven, he was willing to go through whatever was necessary to bring about their forgiveness. As I mentioned before, a lot of people would have considered self over others Jesus did not. Now, we don't have to give ourselves to forgive others, right? Jesus had to go through quite a bit more than we have to, to, uh, to forgive. So when people sin against us, we need to have the same mentality as Jesus. His initial thought was not revenge or vengeance or hoping of bad things. Father, forgive them. We should want people to be forgiven of their sins, else they will be lost in their sin devastating, separated from God from eternity. It shouldn't be our desire to cause harm to others because they've caused harm to us. That, mental, that was not Jesus' mentality. People put him to death. He wanted to bring about life. Now we don't have to sacrifice ourselves. We don't have to give ourselves a sacrifice to bring about forgiveness. But we also can't do something that uh, we can't do something that God Himself can't do. Those individuals who wanted to be forgiven had to acknowledge they had sinned against Jesus. Acts chapter two. And so we can move on from people harming us or causing us pain or doing uh, or sinning against us. We can move on from that. We can make sure that that doesn't burden us or cause us you know, to fall away ourselves. But if they don't ask for forgiveness, they can't truly be forgiven. 
So we can move on from that and we can say we're not going to we're not going to hold grudges and we're not going to seek pain or revenge. We're not going to do unto them as they've done to me, the opposite of the golden rule. But if they don't ask for forgiveness, we can't they can't truly be forgiven. They have to ask for forgiveness. They have to acknowledge that they're wrong in order to be forgiven. And of course, the ultimate forgiveness they need is not necessarily from us, it's from God. And if they don't acknowledge they've sinned against a brother or some individual, then they're not going to receive the, the forgiveness of God. That was one of the conditions. Repent. Once again, I'm not uh, stating that if a person doesn't ask for forgiveness, we, we just hold that against them. But it's res uh, one of the conditions of being forgiven is to repent, to acknowledge sin, to acknowledge error, and to turn away from it. And so we learn from Jesus that it is our desire to be ready when they're, when they're ready, right? So in Acts chapter 2, when the gospel was preached and these individuals knew what they needed to do to receive forgiveness of sins, God was ready to forgive, right? So if people sin against us, they harm us, when they come and ask for forgiveness, what do we need to be? Ready to forgive. And that's, the, that's a lesson that we can learn from Jesus' mentality and attitude on the cross. Is that we're ready to forgive when those individuals are ready to repent. And so, once an individual repents and asks for forgiveness, and they change, we have an obligation, right? Uh, when we look at Matthew chapter 6, Uh, in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is addressing a host of moral issues, spiritual issues that would help individuals be ready for the day of Pentecost when the, when the gospel was first preached. And some of these would have made uh, uh, sense to these individuals Jews having known the law and there being moral law. And of course, Jesus also here planting the seed of transition between the old law and the new law, that there would be some differences. But in Matthew chapter 6, beginning verse 12, uh, here we have a portion of what we might call a model prayer, what people should be thankful for. Uh, and let's just go up to verse 9. Uh, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. And he, he wasn't saying pray these exact words all the time, but after this manner. This is a good example, he's saying. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so he begins the prayer in a way that we always begin, praying to the source, praying to the creator, praying to God the Father. Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We've already read that the kingdom came. Jesus died for it, purchased it with his own blood, Acts 20, verse 28. People were added to it in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Give us this day our daily bread. Notice verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, uh, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, after this model prayer pointing out that we need to forgive as we've been forgiven, as we see what Jesus did for us and understanding that he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. With that in the back of our mind, it, it, it should be relatively easy for us to understand the attitude necessary to forgive, right? These, inter these individuals were being introduced to that idea, forgive as you've been forgiven. Well, we know how we've been forgiven, the Son of God gave Himself sinless a sacrifice so that we could be forgiven. If such a sacrifice was made for me to forgive, then I ought to be able to forgive others who have done much less, right? That, than people did to Jesus. But notice immediately there in verse 14, after this model, Jesus continues to address this topic of forgiveness. For if you forgive men their trespasses, 
your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And at this time, they're still looking in the future towards the death of Jesus. We can look in the hindsight and realize what Jesus had done for us. Notice verse 15. If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We might see here another condition of forgiveness, right? Not only do we have to repent and be baptized in order to have our past sins washed away, according to New Testament, Christian age that we live in today, that mentality or attitude of forgiveness has to be one that we, uh, that we have. It must be that attitude Jesus had on the cross. First to forgive when they're ready. When they repent, we're ready to forgive. Else we don't have an attitude that's right with God. And that's the point he's making here is, if you think you can be a follower of God and not have the mentality or attitude to forgive when somebody asks, you don't have the attitude that God wants us to have. And I might want you to think of this. This is just one aspect of Christian life, isn't it? So this is equal to any other thing that we might say in Christian life. When an individual uh, repents, we need to be ready to forgive. But with regard to any other act of Christianity, we need to be ready to do to as well. Our attitude should be ready to do. For instance, if we are confronted with an error, our first response to that is, should not be, I can't stand that person. They confronted my error, right? The first response of, a, of someone who loves God would be, I need to hear this out to make sure I'm right. Those in Acts chapter 2 were pricked in the heart. They were pricked in the heart to the point where they said, we need to do something about our sin and take care of it. That should be the heart of a Christian. So if someone confronts us with error, we shouldn't be mad or angry. In fact, James says, be slow to wrath, swift to hear. Now, I might have been told something that's wrong. I need to go to the Bible and find that out. But I shouldn't just write something off immediately without researching it or studying it to find out if what they said is true. Remember those noble Bereans? They were commended as being noble because they heard what was said, but they searched the scriptures to see if those things were so. They were slow to wrath and swift to hear. And that's the way we should be. And so anything that God requires of us our attitude should be that same attitude, right? As with regard to forgiveness. Be ready to do it. So when God says you need to be ready to repent, we need to be ready to repent when we're confronted with error. Not swift to anger. We also note in Matthew chapter 18 that it doesn't matter how many times a person sins against us, if they repent, they ask to be forgiven, we should forgive. And we also understand that that's the mentality of God. Paul referred to himself as the chief of all sinners. He did that in teaching others to show if God will forgive me, if God has the grace to forgive me who persecuted the church, I was consenting to the death of Christians, and Paul says God forgave me, then he'll forgive you. So the number of sins, the, uh, what the world might see as the degree of the sin, though God doesn't see degree, you either obey or you don't. But what man might see as degree is not what's considered. What's considered is the heart. Does a man hear the gospel and repent of those sins? That's what God is interested in when it comes to forgiveness. And uh, he talks to Peter here about that, right? In Matthew chapter 18, uh, in verse, Matthew 18, uh, verse 12. Uh, let's see. No, verse 21, I'm sorry. There's a one and a two. Matthew 18, verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, uh, 
How oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? Seven in the New Testament we read through is, is a number that's figurative many times that represents a complete number, like there's seven days in a week. That's one full week, a completed week. Twelve is a number like that. There were twelve disciples. We ended up with twelve months. Um, those are, they just feel com the completed. Um, in teaching, many times uh, when, we, when I ask students to write a point of view and defend it, I usually ask for three pieces of evidence. And I, I generally say three just feels like a good number, right? And I think it's because we've been taught that there are certain things that just completeness, right? So here's seven. Uh, Peter may have been asking a, figure, a, a, a specific number seven times. But that number seven can be figurative to mean, and that's what Jesus tries to teach him is, don't look at the amount of times, look at the completeness of it. So he says uh, in verse 22, Jesus answers and says, I say unto thee, not seven, but until 70 times seven. So now we have seven times 10 times, or seven times 10 plus seven. So Jesus is saying, it's not about the degree, it's not about the number. It's about being willing and ready to forgive and wanting people to repent. Now debating if a person uh, is having a repentance or forgiveness problem, if they need to be re uh, forgiven 70 times 7 is between that individual and God. I sure hope nobody sins against me that many times, but that's between them and God. But our desire, our willingness should be like Jesus. For Father, forgive them. We want them to be forgiven. We're not interested in their demise. The New Testament doesn't say that we have to hang out with everybody in the world either. If somebody sins against us 70 times 7, maybe there comes a time when we forgive them and then we say we probably ought to hang out in different circles, right? But then he continues, okay? He's not, he's not talking about a specific number or degree. He's talking about the attitude, the perspective. We want people to be saved. God wanted people to be saved. The sin against Jesus was heinous, yet, God, yet Jesus said, Father, forgive them. So uh, notice uh, in verse 23, after Jesus has kind of given this kind of uh, general principle about the desire and willingness to forgive and not having a cutoff. He says in verse 23, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. So here he, he gives a parable to teach about forgiveness. Well, let's see what he says about it. Verse 24, And when the king who had account over his servants, when he had begun to reckon, uh, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents owed him a, 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 a debt. We might also point out that if there's no repentance, there will be a reckoning, right? Because in the parable, the king comes to reckon. Now, in, this, in the text of the parable, he's talking about money, but on the great day of judgment, it'll be about our actions. Did we obey God? There will be a day of reckoning. Verse 25, But for as much as he had not to pay... So the man had a debt he could not pay. His Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Now here we might look and point out that we have a debt that we can't repay. Right? Right? We've all, it, once we've sinned, we've broken the law of God. We're no longer sinless. The only way we're going to get to heaven is through obedience to God and being forgiven of our debt. Jesus paid the ultimate price so that we could have forgiveness of our debt. But you and I can't repay it ourselves. So we have to obey God in order to receive the blessings that come from being a servant of God. We have a debt we can't pay. A gracious, merciful God paid the debt for us through His Son's blood on the cross. But there's conditions, right? We have to be obedient. 
Now, continue, verse 28. The servant, so the servant had a debt he couldn't pay. The Lord was merciful and gracious to that servant. But now we find that the servant had somebody who sinned against him or had a debt against him. The same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a debt. And notice the debt is much, much, much less than he owed the king. Right? We have a debt we can't pay the king. Those who have a debt or a sin against us is much less than our sin against Jesus. But it says he owed him a hundred pence. The servant then, having been receive, uh, received some sort of reprieve from the king because of his gracious nature and merciful nature, he does not extend that grace and mercy to his fellow servant, does he? who owed much less, basically nothing compared to what the servant owed the king. And what does he do? Does he have the attitude of the king? Father, forgive them? Nope. It says, he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. He basically said the same thing to that servant that he owed that the servant told the king. Right? And he would not. So here's an individual who, 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 was, who received the blessing of forgiveness, mercy, grace, over a debt that was much, much greater than the one that was owed to him, but he didn't have the attitude to extend that mercy or grace or forgiveness to someone else. Fellow servant. A fellow servant. Someone he had worked with, maybe. Someone he knew. But he went out and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and they came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, had called him, and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Very s simple for us when we read this to see where Jesus there in Matthew 6 said, If you don't forgive your fellow man, you will not be forgiven. And it's not about not wanting to forgive, it's the attitude. If you don't have the attitude to forgive, you don't have the attitude to be forgiven. You're not penit penitent. You don't have a soft, compassionate, loving heart. You want to be forgiven, but you don't want to forgive. You don't have, that's not the attitude that God wants. And so verse 34, his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. And then he says, so likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. And the key there is heart, right? Do we love one another enough? Do we love God enough? And that's why everything comes from that. If we love God, what are we going to do? We're going to hear his word and do what he says. We're not going to fight with him, argue with him, lie about it, try to find ways around it. If we love God, we're going to hear his word and do it. If we, if we love God, we're going to love our fellow man. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. If we love Jesus and appreciate what he did for us, we're going to extend that same love to others. We have sin, Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But because of our obedience to the gospel, we've been forgiven of our past sin, added to the church. Every sinner can be forgiven. Any individual who wants to be forgiven can be. God is the Savior of the world. So if an individual wants to be saved, he must come to God, hear his word, Believe it, repent of his past sins, confess that salvation comes only through that sacrifice of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, be baptized in order to have forgiveness of sins, Acts 2 verse 38, 
God will wash away your sins. He will add you to the church. You will become a member of the body of the saved, a body of believers who love one another, who want to help one another get to heaven. And so every sin can be forgiven, but every sinner must repent in order to be forgiven. God wants us to repent. He's ready to forgive. We need to be ready to repent so that we can be forgiven. And we need to love our fellow man enough that when they repent, when those who sin against us repent, that we're ready to forgive them. There are many passages in the New Testament that can go along with this lesson on forgiveness. But that very succinct statement on the cross kind of sums it all up. Father, forgive them. While he was hanging on a cross being murdered for nothing, just for being who he was. And so we see the amazing forgiving nature of God. And that should brighten our lives. And uh, when we have our lives brightened, we should shine that brightness to others and make their day a little better too. God can make our day better and we can love God enough to say he made our day better, we can help others be, have their day better. And so we want to be forgiven. If you want to be forgiven of your past sins and you've not obeyed the gospel, please do so before it's too late. Let God wash away your sin. Show your love for God through obedience to his will. Be baptized in order to have your sins remitted. Remain faithful to the end. Love God and remain faithful to the end. Revelation 2 verse 10 so that we can ultimately receive the ultimate reward of, for, of forgiveness, and that is to live with God in eternity, receive the crown of life. And then, of course, let us always remember that if we've wronged somebody, let's go to them and make things right. Let's be ready to repent, and let's be ready to forgive when somebody sins against us. If we can help anybody today,